Hello and welcome to Light Talk. This is Stan and I'm broadcasting from my state-of-the-art studios in the swampy land of Gainesville, Florida. Hi, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. And this is David broadcasting from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood in Long Beach, California. And we are the Lumen Brothers! <laughs> and we're still rolling in the summertime. Yes, moving right into the summer. Uh, boy, uh, we have a lot of action here. Uh, I know that Steve is getting ready to go to New York to do a show. I'm ready to go to Central City to do my uh, 20th season at the Central City Opera. And Stan is heading to San Francisco. I left my heart. Just for a, sh- <laughs> a very short, short turnaround. Just a day in bath. Oh, will you have any time to go to Ghirardelli to get a hot fudge sundae? You know, I, I'm going to be staying at the St. Regis, which seems really classy for a guy like me. So I'll probably have uh, some nice food. Well, very nice. Uh, I'm going to walk around. I may have some time to walk around the, tomorrow night and maybe, depends on how, to, how Thursday goes. It could be one hour of busyness or five hours of busyness. All right. Well, we hope that you have a great time in San Francisco. Anyway, why don't we Thank just you. get started? Uh, we have some announcements next week that we'll, we'll tell you about next week. <laughs> But why don't we get started? <laughs> and uh, our first question, believe it or not, I have the first question today. It is from June in North Carolina. And June asks, my teacher is on my case about returning to a summer stock that I have worked at for the past two summers. He feels a third summer there is not in my best interest. But I think I improve every time I work there. What do you think? Well, um, we're talking about summer stock theater. And it is really timely that we talk about this now because everyone's about ready to go off to summer stock. (laughs) Well, not everyone, but a lot of us do that. Um, I am sort of uh, a firm believer in summer stock because that's how I really got into all this mess. Uh, You know, even early on, you know, when I was, I don't know, 17, 18 years old, one of the first gigs I got was a summer stock uh, theater company in Miami, Florida. It was a really small company that was affiliated with the University of Miami uh, Ring Theater. And we just did like four musicals every summer, you know, one right after the other. Bam, 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 with like, you know, all night turnarounds, things like that. You know, the stuff you do in summer stock in a theater that was not air conditioned in Miami, Florida, which was also a lot of fun. But yeah, I am a huge, huge fan of summer stock. I feel that a good summer stock company, and notice I said good because not not all of them are good, but at least the ones that I've been involved in were, a good summer stock company gives you a really great experience in a theatrical family. You are there in a company and you guys are basically living together, breathing together, working together, doing a lot of things together that we'll not talk about on this show. But usually it it does breed this wonderful, wonderful community. And that's sort of what theaters should, should be about. Uh, community of artists and all that. Uh, you basically work at the summer stock company. You become um, friends, uh, and you sometimes see each other over and over and over again for several to many years. Family is all part of that. I believe that a summer stock company is a family. Uh, you've got the spirit of theater. You got family geography. Well, that is where that summer stock company is. And I have worked at a lot of summer stock companies where the geography was absolutely beautiful. I know that there are companies all over the country where they're usually in in gorgeous places. Uh, I've been working at uh, several. uh, Chautauqua, New York, that was on a lake. It was absolutely gorgeous. It was a great place to be. I've been working for the past 20 years in um, at Central City, which is up in the Rocky Mountains. Again, a beautiful place to go and a beautiful place to live and to create art. And then finally, connections. You will make some of the best professional connections in summer stock. Uh, Most of these companies will have professional directors. Some of them are union summer stock companies where you'll be working with professional stagehands. You'll be working with professional stage managers. So that is really, really important. Now, let's talk about what you learn at Summerstock. Uh, One thing you learn as a lighting designer is how to work with a rep plot, if indeed that is what the Summerstock company is using. Most companies do use some type of a rep plot. So you'll you'll learn how to work and design within a rep plot, which unfortunately it seems to be a dying art. And I know that Stan is going to be studying that and teaching a class this summer, which we'll get into next week on that. You learn how to work fast and accurately. 
because let's face it, you're not going to have three or four tech days in summer stock. Sometimes there's a one day turnaround to the next show. So you have to learn how to work fast and accurately, which will serve you in the business no matter what you're doing, even Broadway shows. Uh, it's a great resume builder. You know, again, you're working with multiple directors, you're working with multiple stage managers, different designers, that sort of thing. So anyway, yeah, so those are the real advantages of working in a summer stock theater. Okay, June, uh, so I'm going to answer your question. Uh, David talked about all the reasons one wants to work in summer stock, and I don't, I don't have a dog in that fight. Um, I think summer stock is great for all the reasons he's mentioned it. But your question is, I have worked for the past two summers in a particular summer stock theater. My teacher thinks it's not in my best interest to return there. I agree with your teacher. You've been at this one summer stock theater for two seasons. Find another theater. Go make new contacts. Go have new experiences. You know, for example, one could argue that the Glimmer Glass Opera Company is a summer stock theater. One could also argue that Santa Fe Opera is a summer stock theater. So why not work at both of them? Why not work at uh, the Berkshire Theater Festival or Jacob's Pillow? You also specify you're a student. I think after a couple of years, you've learned everything you're going to learn at that theater. Maybe move to a theater that's a little bit more challenging, a little bit more demanding, has uh, perhaps a better, um, a better grade of director or, uh, or designers who are working on a different scale. So I would say cast your net a little bit further you can remain friends with all these people. Who knows, maybe your fourth year you go back there. But I would cast my net further, and I would work at a lot of different summer stock theaters. You know, I, I kind of agree with you, Steve. I mean, that's one way of looking at it, and, and a lot of people do that. Uh, and I think it, a lot has to do with what type of person you are and what type of experience you want. I'm kind of a nester <laughs> when I find a group of people I like, I kind of like to stay with them. But again, I'm not early in my career anymore. Exactly. You're of a different age. And, and so it makes sense to go back where you have friends and family and shared experiences. But June here could be a high school student. Mm -hmm. She could be an undergraduate. Maybe she's a graduate student. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, she's a student. I think that's a good point. And, and I, I tend to lean towards Steve's position on this because of, of June and her particular age and where she is in her career. And, and I, you know, just briefly, I've had both experiences. I've worked at one place once and it was hell. I learned a lot and it was great and it was intense and all of that. And then I worked at another place that was pretty large uh, for three summers in a row. And it was great. And this is sort of this old adage that, I don't know if you guys have ever heard this, like the first year you go somewhere, you're the new thing, you're the shiny new object and you're, you're really cool because you're new. The second year, you're sort of hot, like you're, you're, well, everybody knows you and you're going to perform really well again and you do a great job. So the first year is you're new, the second year is you're hot and the third year, you're sort of old news. We've seen you before, you know, maybe we're getting tired of oh. you or maybe you're getting <laughs> tired of it. Then I'm really old news at 20 years. <laughs> I'm not saying that's gospel, uh, but I've heard that, I've read that, like there's like the three years of fame, new, hot, and old news, and then sometimes you get a second term, like the Beatles, you know, <laughs> you get, <laughs> keep getting renewed. But but I want to say, I've had that both experiences. I, I, one particular place, uh, you know, uh, Jay Herzog, a friend of mine, got me into the Park Playhouse in Albany, New York. We did big scale outdoor musicals. I loved it. I went for three summers. I did three great shows really added to my portfolio, helped my network. But, but back to June's thing, I want to, uh, Steve rattled off a bunch of really great uh, companies that, that operate in the summer, and I want to just add one more to the list, and one that we have been really, uh, in the past, at, uh, my students have had great success, um, is the Williamstown Theater Festival. And some people call that lighting boot camp. It is probably the most intensive training you'll get in lighting and summer stuff that I have heard of. So I think to Steve's point, if you, I don't know, maybe you, maybe the two places you've been is Williamstown, but um, there's a way to move up the ladder there to start out as an intern, then become an electrician, then become an ALD. It's really, you know, a lot of uh, very uh, powerful designers spend their summers there. And then you, there's relationships can get built like Glimmerglass, like Santa Fe. I, I agree with that. So I think uh, I'll throw that out there as Williamstown. If you were, if you're ready to move on to another one, that's not to say that three years in one place 
hurts. It's, it can be comfortable, but you're still learning from there. I think it's your it's it's your value system, June, in terms of what you want to do. There's a lot of options out there, but I would encourage you if you're serious about lighting, um, in particular, and depending on where you're at in your career, take a look and see if you can get your foot in the door at Williamstown. I think if for lighting, they really it's it's it really is lighting boot camp. Yeah, and and there are there is a difference between like what people think of summer stock and these big music festivals uh, like Santa Fe, you know, and Glimmerglass and Central City and places like that. Um, there are different levels of theater professionalism there, and if you can get into one of the major companies, you know, uh, Stan was talking about uh, lighting boot camp. You know, you could say that about Santa Fe too, but you know, you're going to be working with the best people in the world. And that's pretty damn cool. And you'll be working with great technology. But if you're working in a little playhouse, you know, down the street, then I moved, you know, toward what, what, what Steve was saying. You got to get out and start doing really big companies. I mean, again, I started out in a very small community uh, summer stock uh, company, but then I quickly moved up, you know, to like Dallas Shakespeare Festival and then to Chautauqua and, and other places. So I think that's really, you know, something important to remember is that not every summer stock is the same. And also it depends if, if it's a union crew or not, because you can't do 24 hour turnarounds with the union crew. So, you know, that's one of the ways well, that, the, Met, uh, well, the Met does it three, eight hour shifts. Yeah, yeah, different shifts, exactly, right, but right. not all companies do that. I do want to add something to your point, David, about you know the, the larger companies. It, it seems that if you've got sort of a good foundation level of skills, which sounds like June would have after two years at one summer stock, you, you're working pretty cheap, and you're young, and you're not going to get a lot of compensation. So that what I tell my students is if you're going to sort of, you know, um, uh, give a lot of your time away in a sense. You might as well do it someplace that might have some payback, like Steve is saying, you know, something that by going to those companies where you're really going to learn and you're really going to meet people uh, that might help uh, build your career. So, but doing so to, to cut your teeth at a place that's maybe smaller makes sense. But then once you've sort of got some fundamental competencies, you really want to, you learn best when you're around people who know more than you do. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So our second question comes from Tommy in Chicago, and he writes, Help! I have a low ceiling in our high school theater space. It's only 12 feet high. What do you suggest for a 20 by 14 proscenium stage? The room is only 30 by 40. Well, low ceilings are a pain, and you've kind of figured that out. But a low ceiling is not uh, unusual in Chicago at the storefront theaters. It's not unusual in New York City at off-off-Broadway theaters. Um, The thing about a low ceiling is you have to be careful about it not being a distraction to your audience. So clearly, two types of distraction. One, the lights in the audience's face uh, from backlight. And two, the actors are walking around stage. And even though the light is four or five feet above their head, it still is a distraction because you think, ah, oh, that tall guy's going to walk into it. Uh, so what I do is I would, I would suggest you think about dance and you would push those lights into the sides, into the wings. You try to clear that central acting space of lights and you light it as a dance piece. So that's, that's my, uh, my simple answer for that question. I think it's good. I think, I think it's a good point. I did a show here years ago in a very small thrust space and, it's not quite that low, but yeah, I pushed everything to the sides. Uh, maybe some some open. If you gotta have, if you, if you really need some downlight, maybe you use like an open face fixture that has barn doors so you can shield it. You know, shielding. Uh, you know, uh, barn doors, top hats, um, wide angle lenses, um, wash fixtures, and yeah, I, I agree with Steve's uh, Steve's idea. Um, push it to the sides. Uh, high side light, low side light. Um, it depends on whether he has. We don't know if he has wings that he can push light into the and you know across the stage or not. Um, but yeah, it can be, can be, can be handled. Yeah. And it's funny. I'm just going to mention a technique that I teach for open stage lighting. That's really important when you're dealing with low ceilings or even with, uh, you know, in, in a theater where you can see the lighting fixtures. And that is, you got to understand that, um, if, if the lighting fixture is close to the ground (laughs) and I say that, you know, 20 feet or less is close to the ground for me. And if the audience can see the lens, then you really have to be careful about pumping that light up, turning that light on. Uh, because if when that light comes on, even if it comes on slowly, uh, 
it will distract the eye for the audience. The audience will look up. Um, so what I do and I, what I teach my students to do is especially in subtle moments when like maybe a special is going to come up and you have a, a, you know, this huge pull down, you know, um, is that you preheat that filament. So the lens is just glowing a little bit and it comes on at like, I don't know, 10 seconds or something like that in a previous cue so that when you do this pull down, then you're going to have this follow of this special coming up. That light is not coming from black in a black void. That light actually is just getting warmer and brighter. And yes, it, it's, it will be somewhat distracting, but not nearly as distracting as if it's coming from black. So that's a little trick that I learned when I first started to light because I first started to light in a stage like that with a low ceiling and, uh, and it was open stage. So you can see all the lighting fixtures. I have a question for you, David, on that one. Have, have you, have you, I, I, I haven't run into this yet myself in this situation. How would you, how, would you apply the same technique, technique to LED or did something? Oh different? yeah. Because the LED is doing the same. You'd still see the lens. You know what I mean? You're, you're going to still see the lens light up. Right. Right. So, yeah, it doesn't matter what the source is. You know, even if it's an arc source, I'd have it like, you know, running it like mm-hmm. right when the dowser starts opening. You know, I once heard, I once heard of a trick on how to make a, uh, a CMY discharge lamp moving light fade to zero more smoothly. Maybe Steve has heard this trick. Basically, they used the dowser to a certain point and then they brought in the color flags and yep. closed all the color flags and then finished the out with the dowser so it was smoother at the low end i've never done that myself but i, I that used was to do it cool. all the time you had yeah. to do it that, the, the lights are better now the dowsers are much better right, now right, right but yeah i mean i used to do that all the time it's called a color black a color and you basically uh-huh. do yeah you'd basically do a cmy color uh color black as you're coming out yeah, you know, you delay it and you come in, and and they do the same thing coming on. Right. Uh, right. It was. It's not ideal because you do see a little shift of color. Absolutely. Well, that's why I was wondering about the the LED has all these dimming profiles, and I haven't had a chance to play with them all yet. So I was curious if you had. No, no. I mean, I I really I really haven't done that. Um, but you know, I I do it whenever you can see the lens of the light. It's just it's a totally different situation because. It's what's happening around you in contrast. Well, it looks like I have the next question from uh, someone named Russell in Georgia. And he wants to know, does it matter to you where you start your focus? Do you start downstage or upstage? Well, depends. It depends, but I'll I'll just throw a couple (laughs) of scenarios out. I mean, for me, if, if it's an open stage and it's dance, depends on my crew it depends on so many things so like if the crew if the if the crew is great and we're going to blow through this thing and i have professionals then i, I like to start upstage uh, and work my way down because I'm, I'm curious to see how my backlight's going to work if it's an open stage if it's a set it, the set is going to sort of influence where i'm going to go philosophically i will do the most difficult things to get to first because that's when everybody's fresh everybody has energy everybody is, is gangbusters to get going and the easy stuff you know, people are more tired at the end of the day. So, if some, I, I think of it from that way. Or if there's something in particular that I'm not 100% sure how it's going to work and I'm curious to see it, or it might take a lot of finesse or a lot of tweaking, I'm probably going to get to that first as well. So, it depends on, you know, the environment, it depends on the stage, it depends on the crew, uh, it depends on my time, right? Um, how many electricians do I have going at the same time? So, uh, but if I had to choose how I would like to do it, I like to start upstage and work my way down and do front light last. But that's just me. Yeah. Okay. It also depends on if they're installing the set and where <laughs> right. they're installing right. the set. And, right. and you guys may be laughing, but it's true. That's true. You know, Absolutely. It doesn't matter how much time you have, although it kind of does, sure. but you never have enough time. Let's just face it. That's um, true. And you want to be spending your time at the table lighting the show and not focusing. Right. So you want to get the focus done as fast and as efficiently and as precisely as possible. And if they're, you know, if they're, if they need the stage upstage, you know, the, the finish building the set and then you've got you the downstage, downstage stuff, you work downstage. Yeah, that, you if they're adjust, working right. downstage and you finished upstage or you can get stuff done, you can, um, you know, something that, uh, I learned a trick, you know, from Neil and, uh, 
and Ken is that you and, and Gilbert for that matter, you uh, you know, sometimes you don't have drops up yet, but you know where they're gonna fall. Well, you bring the pipe in and you and you uh, lay down a line of tape and you cut off of that tape. You know, I mean, you just do things that, you know, that will efficiently make your focus go faster. Um, Personally, I hate front light. I agree with Stan. I think front light is really boring. It has to be focused because a lot of times I use it. Um, So I always like to leave that to last. I really don't care about where on stage I start to focus as long as it's efficient. Uh, and I can get as much done, you know, in, in the shortest amount of time. What do you think, Steve? Well, if I'm doing something like dance, I do overheads, front of house, and then booms last. But typically, yeah, booms typically last, I yeah. ask the production electrician where he wants to start. It, it doesn't matter to me. So it's really important to have a plan, you know, and, and talk to your assistant and talk to your uh, production electrician and your TD of what your plan is and you plan out you because the TD can say, well, I really need upstage for at least the first two hours. And so you know that you're not going upstage with a ladder and that's cool so that you can help them and help yourself by understanding. The worst thing you can do is to go in there blind and not have a plan because then all of a sudden you're jamming and, they, and then you, you could end up not focusing a, 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 um, an electric. I actually saw that happen. I was assisting a designer where we thought things were going to go in a certain way. We had planned out the focus perfectly. And just because there were problems with the set, we never got to an electric. Never did. The electric was just hung. It was circuited and never focused. You know, Steve Shelley in his book, because I've been going through his book lately, actually suggests, and he did a lot of road work, right? Yeah. Having a focus cue stack. We would like go through, you know, electric by electric, channel by channel, and, and, and basically got him into a rhythm he knew was, if he was doing the same, probably I imagine if he's doing the same show over and over again in different theaters, you know, as we had, he had a, a rhythm to it and uh, knew how he wanted to do it. You are listening to Light Talk, and our sponsor today is Mock Java Software. Meet Alex, the operations manual reader. Are you frustrated that you don't quite understand some of the fancy gear you own? Are there not enough young people born after 1990 around to help you program that old VCR, the answering machine, or the newest lighting desk? Do you find yourself throwing up your hands saying, this worked last week, now nada, dead as a doornail? (laughs) Then you need Alex, the operations manual reader. Have the most important manuals read to you anywhere while doing anything. Perfect for multitasking wherever you might be. Don't just keep pushing different buttons to see what works. Are you tired of being embarrassed by teenagers who understand your technology better than you? Then you need Alex, the operations manual reader. Earbuds and you fill your brain with chapters of knowledge effortlessly. Alex, the automated manual reader, does the reading for you. Keep all your gear working perfectly because you paid attention to the operations manual. Or, at the very least, you heard about that feature somewhere. Don't get shown up by young geeks anymore. Alex, the operations manual reader, the app that saves face. End <laughs> ignorance today with Alex, the automated manual reader, developed by Mock Java, software you can't live without. The only reading you'll ever have to do. Hey, <laughs> I, must, I, I can relate because I just bought a new keyboard and set it up. And of course, I don't, wa- I don't want to read the read? manual. Did you read? Did you I, have it read I, to you? I, I, no, I don't want to read it because <laughs> I, I want to play. I there in lies the problem. <laughs> and play. I've, I have no, no patience for manual reading. And, and these manuals are written very well. Even you can though have it Italian read to company. you while you sleep with Alex. I, I think that's really smart by why you sleep. But, you know, you mentioned something in there, Stan, that kind of piqued my interest when you talked about multitasking (laughs) (laughs) the mutant multitasker the the mutant multitasker um you know i've been doing a lot of studies on this over the past 15 years because it drives me absolutely crazy when i see people quote multitasking unquote thinking that they can actually do two things three things four things at once and of course, the three of us are professors, so we have witnessed many of our students doing this. And now I'm going to talk very generally here, so please, no one take offense. But I don't believe that it is possible to truly multitask. 
at least not for human beings. Mothers do it amazingly well. Uh, no, they don't. They actually switch on and off their, their tasks. They, there's a difference between multitasking and time management and organizing your time to do tasks. You cannot do two tasks at the same time. Our human brains are not made that way. And many studies have confirmed this. Uh, they've done studies at MIT. They've done studies at Stanford, uh, multi, quote, multitasking studies, because students, for some reason, and again, generally speaking, there are exceptions, absolutely believe that they could listen to a lecture while at the same time having their notebooks open, reading Facebook, and also chatting with someone else because they really believe they can actually multitask. No, that's not what happens. You cannot multitask. You cannot do two things at the same time. Not the well. studies have, yeah, not, no, yeah, not very well at all, actually. Uh, studies have shown that if you're doing one thing, if you're studying or just watching this lecture, you're actually going to perceive between 80 and 90% of it. As soon as you add something else, it drops down to like 55%. And then you add a third thing, then it's like 30%. So there's no way you can really multitask. Let, let, me, let me add something in here. If we are to believe the French, and I say if, if we are to believe the French, they tell us that we can multitask relatively well if it's only two things because we have two hemispheres to our brain. If we try to multitask a third item, the French say it overwhelms your brain completely and your efficiency drops to less than 40%. It depends on what you're doing. Because if you're doing a motor skill and you're listening to a lecture at the same time, yes, that's multitasking. Uh, however, if you're listening to a lecture and doing research on Facebook at the same time or that's wherever, work, that yeah. is not going to work. That's, our brains don't work that way. They, you got to switch it on and off. So you can have like your, you know, you could be watching a movie, right? And uh, have your computer on your lap and uh, reading emails while that movie's going on. When you look down and start reading the email, you basically shut down that movie. It's on playing in the background, but you're getting such a small percentage of it. It's really not registering. So yeah, you're right, Steve. The French do say that, but it just depends on, ex on what you're doing when it comes to the hemispheres of the brain, I believe. <laughs> like I know what I'm talking about when it comes to the well, brain surgery. If, if we believe the French, they would support what you're saying. They say once you start to multitask, you start making a lot of mistakes and your brain starts slowing down and you start losing that is true. and you start losing information through that idea of switching on and switching off. And the reason why I'm bringing this up <laughs> is because it kind of drives me crazy when I see students do this. I don't allow open uh, computers in my classrooms unless they need the computer to present their project at the time they're presenting the project. I don't allow it uh, because they're not, A, they're not listening to what I'm saying, they're not listening to what their classmates are saying, and B, it is rude. It is rude when a classmate is presenting a project and another classmate is in the room looking at a computer. I remember the days when I had students sitting in my classroom when I was teaching large sections of introduction to theater, and I had a woman who sat in the back reading a newspaper. It was pre-computers. And, <laughs> and, and I, I was just shocked at, at the rudeness of that. It's and rude! It's, it is. Uh, you know, there's a, well, you know... Uh, David sent me this link to this frontline piece about what was it called, Digital Nation? Yeah, it's a great, and, great uh, documentary. Yeah, I started watching it. It's fascinating. And, and I got up to the part where the guy is talking about, you know, when Google first came out, the, the, this is, was a particular researcher. There's one guy apparently at UCLA maybe or so that researches this question. And he said that, oh, it's going to be good for us. We're going to be more knowledgeable. We're going to be doing multiple things at once. It's going to be great. And, and now he has completely reversed his initial research on right. that. And is saying the the opposite. I, I'm curious to watch the rest of that frontline piece because it's oh, it's fantastic because they go into this yeah they go into this whole yeah. thing about how we're so overwhelmed with technology and distraction. information yeah. distraction that yeah. students are not learning how to focus in and do critical thinking. Their critical thinking skills are not there. I think we are in uncharted waters in this regard. We really don't know the impacts. We do know the impact. The impact in multitasking is it makes you fat. 
<laughs> one, one, well, that explains my well, if problem. Eat, if you eat while you're playing video games, probably. No, what it, what it suggests is that when you're multitasking and you're eating, eating is the lowest priority for your brain because you're trying to solve complex issues. So when you're eating and multitasking, your brain is not sending the correct signal to your stomach saying, hey, you're full, let's stop eating. So, oh, I believe so that. what happens is you continuously nibble and eat through the multitasking process, uh, and you simply are getting useless calories into your body. Well, there is this, we know this, that, and, and I've been experimenting with this on my own body. They, they say, and I, th- I think it's true from my experience, that the, the delay time between when your stomach and when you're satiated and when you get the signal that you're satiated is 20 minute delay. And I have found that if I eat, a, if I consciously really work to have a small portion, I've talked about this with my doctor, and then I'll still feel hungry after that small portion. But if I wait 20 minutes, I don't feel hungry anymore. There is quite a delay between that. And I, I found that to be, I found that assertion in my own life to be quite true. Okay, pulling this conversation from food <laughs> to back the lighting. <laughs> yes. uh, another reason why you guys have to understand that multitasking is not really possible is you got to get out of the habit of having your computer open and actually on an unrelated website while you're doing a show. Mm-hmm. I have seen this happen with students and assistants. You need to be focused on that show. And if your computer is open and you and it's open to Facebook or something like that, you know, while you're working on the show, let me tell you something. People notice that. Oh, and sure. and and I because I had directors come up to me and say, you know, I noticed your second assistant. And, and when I found out, I talked to my second assistant about it. So, you know, if you're on a break, fine, no problem. You know, if they've stopped to do something, you know, they're fixing a wagon or something like that. Yeah, okay, you got got to check something in your email, go ahead. But while you're lighting a show or in the process of creation, don't do that because it really leaves a very bad signal. So multitasking, no, it's not possible. Now, back to Light Talk. Sherry in Australia writes, do you ever time code your shows? If so, is it difficult? Uh, no, it's not difficult at all. You know, uh, time code is just another tool that most consoles have. Uh, you simply um, use a, a SMPTE signal or, or MIDI, and you take that information, and you teach your console. Sometimes there's a learn button, and you just sync your uh, cues to that track. Uh, if, if you want to experiment with time code, What I would recommend is that you find yourself, uh, you know, the next time you're doing a a short dance piece that's three to five minutes, just go ahead and time code that thing and see how easy it is to do. I mean, in rock and roll shows, time code is starting and stopping all the time. It can get you through a really difficult sequence of cues and, and have the same thing happen night after night after night. If you have a dancer who is supposed, you're supposed to have a blackout when they leap into the air and they leap into the air on the fourth measure and that quarter note, that blackout's going to happen that way every time. So time code's a good thing and it's easy to do. There, every manufacturer has videos up on how to use their console and how to integrate time coding into it. Yep, my students do it all the time. We just, they're doing their hog factor, they finished it. Everything's time coded, everything. And you have to a lot of times because you can't busk some of this stuff. You just can't. So yeah, you got a time code. And time code is a great, great time saver, like Steve said. You know what I love on the hedgehog uh, or the hogs is that I love the learn timing feature where you just turn it on and you start the music and just hit go when you want the cue and then it just stamps it right there for you. And then you can go yep. in and adjust it after the fact. I love it. Yeah, it's, it's great. Time code is great. Well, guys, that Hammond organ solo tells us that once again, you've spent a precious 37 minutes of your life listening to Light Talk. (laughs) You can listen to Light Talk every week on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, and Spotify. And don't forget to join Light Talk on Facebook so that you can post your questions and comments. And be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes. That way you won't miss one moment of Lumen Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. In other words, stop and think. Don't multitask. Don't multitask. (laughs) 
Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Long Beach, Gainesville, and the Lone Star State. And be sure to tune in next week when we discuss tunable white light, dichroic color and LEDs, what is a green fund, and the most pressing question of all, can I print on my gels? All of that and a new sponsor, Light Talk, broadcasting questionable Lumen knowledge and humor around the world. So we'll see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.